Aleluia. Aleluia. They are obviously exiting. Let's not waste this moment. How many of you came to God's house today expecting God to do something in your life? Now, there's a difference in wanting him to do it and expecting him to do it. Let me tell you why you can expect it. He said, if two or three of you get together in my name, what's his name? Jesus. He said, I'll be in your midst. <laughs> now, whenever Jesus gets in the midst of anything, he's going to change everything. If there's a dark place in your life, he's, he's about to light it up. If you feel sick, I'm telling you, the healer is in the house. <laughs> hey, and just let me tell you, if you're lost, if you don't know Jesus, he's as close as you speaking his name and asking him to forgive you of your sins. Hallelujah to God forevermore. Well, I'll tell you, I'll set this up and then we'll be seated and see what the Lord has for us. I spent a great, great, great deal of time before God alone this week in my closet. And by late last night, I thought that I had a message. I was ready to preach it. And when he woke me up around three, he had a different thing for me to say today. So you're going to get a different thing. Now I ask you, O oh Lord, to let us receive the word of God with gladness. It just struck me, Lord, they that received your word with gladness were baptized and they rejoice. So let there be a glad spirit in here today. Because God has come to fix what's broken and make right what's wrong. God is here, a good God. And we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being seated and smile at somebody on the way down. <laughs> As you know, Sandra and I were on vacation uh, back in June, and I think I think we returned maybe the third Sunday in June, second or third. And on that Sunday, I called a solemn assembly and told you that God had spoken to me and called this church to prayer. And on that first night, because we could not get in this building for repairs, we packed out the Family Life Center. There was standing room only, and for two hours we prayed. And it has been that way ever since. Every Monday, Monday night now in here, hundreds and hundreds of you have been coming to pray. And the word has gotten out. And from time to time, I have people stop me and say, What's going on at your church? This, people are talking about it. And I, and I want to say, why is a prayer meeting such a novel thing in these last days? What is the deal? But I actually had a wonderful pastor stop me. And he said, can you verify something for me? I said, sure. He said, I heard that on Sunday morning, you called a prayer meeting. And the next night, there was standing room only. Is that true? I said, that is true. He shook his head and he said, I want that. I want that. And then he said, what do you attribute that to? And without thinking, I just, I blurted out a visitation from God. God is visiting us. See, God's always present, but there are times when he makes a special house call. 
He said it throughout Scripture. He said, I'm going to visit Pharaoh. He said, I'm going to visit the house of Jacob. I'm going to visit the house of Israel. In other words, the all-present God chooses times when he will come and especially deal with you or me or us. And that's happening right now in this church. And I want to say to everybody, do not miss this time of visitation. I want to say to the parents who are so concerned that their children get to bed on time so they won't be cranky in the morning and can really study the next day, don't miss this time of visitation. Because if they make straight A's and grow up and go to the finest schools and do not have an encounter with God and a walk with Jesus, I'm sorry, it sounds like failure to me. You see, I'd rather have my children exposed to the power of the Holy Spirit than to go to the best schools. I, I'm not mad, I'm telling you, you, you can't afford to miss this time of visitation. Your children need to see people caught up in the Spirit and praying and crying and beseeching and blessing the name of the Lord in mass. Don't miss this time of visitation tomorrow night at seven. But I want to also say to you individuals, if you of late have felt a stirring, you know, just something on the inside is beginning to claw at you about God and about your soul and about eternity and about righteousness. Folks, that's a visitation from God. Don't miss it. Don't push it to the side. Don't squelch it. Listen very carefully because the Lord in, in His gentlemanly fashion will never kick your door down and come in and impose Himself on you. He will gently whisper to you and then He expects you to open up so that He can come in. He's knocking at the door. He's wanting to get in. And so many times through history, especially biblical history, we see that people missed the time of their visitation. When Jesus was riding a donkey into Jerusalem, he stopped just outside the gates. He heard the hustle and the bustle and the business, the money making, and all of the, the accoutrements of a bustling society up there in Jerusalem. And he stopped and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often would I have taken you under my wings as a mother hen takes her chick under her wings, but you would not? And then he said it, because you do not know the time of your visitation. You do not know that this is your day and God is here. You don't even understand. You will not listen and see that God has appointed this time for me to come and bring you salvation. You are too busy. You don't even know it's the time of your visitation. So I, I implore you, brother, sister, watching on camera, watching on the website, I implore you, hear what I'm telling you today, and please know that this stirring is not just you. It's not just the situation you're in. This is God's Holy Spirit saying, open the door. I have something to bring to you. Do not miss my visitation. And you see, if you go through scriptures, follow Jesus through scripture, it's, it's the same everywhere he goes. He's giving people an opportunity He's not giving a whole crowd an opportunity. There are some in the crowd that he points out that he has his mind on, such as the case with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a tax collector. Jesus is walking through Jericho. Zacchaeus is short of stature. The crowd is thronging Jesus, but there's something inside of Zacchaeus, a stirring, a moving, a drawing towards this man Jesus. And because he's a short fella, 
He can't see Jesus. So the Bible says he ran on ahead of the crowd and he climbed up in a sycamore tree and he watched the crowd coming in his, his way and he looked in the crowd and he said, I, I, I believe that's him right there. That's got to be him. And as the crowd moved closer and closer to his tree, that man looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down. I got an appointment at your house today. Your time of visitation is upon you. Come down. And of all the people around Jesus, it was Zacchaeus' time for a visitation from Jesus. He didn't miss it. He climbed down. He went home. And before you know it, Jesus is sitting in his parlor. And Jesus is sitting in his kitchen eating his bread. Jesus is talking to Zacchaeus about his life because he did not miss the time of his visitation. There's that also that woman with the issue of blood. You know, we say that she had female problems. She's bleeding to death. She's been to every doctor and the doctors have taken all her money and she's not one bit better and she knows that her life is about to end, but she sees a crowd coming. And there's something about the murmurings of this crowd, the, the excitement of that gathering. And somebody said, that's Jesus. And she said, Jesus. And she said, I'm a sick woman. And I hear Jesus can heal a sick woman. And she went and tried to elbow, elbow her way into the crowd. Can I tell you something? Now listen to me. I want you to listen. You can't be dignified when you need something from Jesus. I'm talking to somebody here today. You're trying to be dignified in his presence. You've got a reputation to protect. You're known as a stalwart person. You got everything under control. You got it going on, but you've got a need in your life. And Jesus is passing by. And Jesus says, this is the time of your visitation. Don't try to be royal in front of Jesus. Just elbow your way until you can touch the hem of his garment. Let me, let me elaborate on that for just a moment. Women had a much, a very inferior place in that society, especially sick women. And when she tried to get to him, I'm sure there was rudeness galore. She was pushed away. But she said, this may be my only opportunity. And at some point, you're going to have to realize, brother, things don't just happen. You're going to have to get in there and make it happen. Well, if Jesus wants to heal me, he will. Uh-uh. No. That's what the devil told you. That's what people tell you. Well, I guess I'm in God's will, and I'm not going to try to fight it. No, sir. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. If there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church and let them anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. You see, you've got to stop saying well, it may not be the Lord's will. Why wouldn't it be the Lord's will? If he took stripes and died for you to be restored. Why wouldn't it be the Lord's will? And she said, this is it. So she began to push people, elbow people, upset people. And when she got near enough, I believe she lunged. And I believe as she came down, she swiped the hem of his garment. And everything froze at that moment. Jesus said, who touched me? And the people said... Now, Lord, there are thousands of people around you. Lots of people have touched you. He said, no, no. Lots of people may have touched me, but somebody just touched me. Somebody came in faith. Somebody came not just trying to figure out what's going on. Somebody came not wanting to be entertained or be in a big crowd. Somebody came with a need in their life and their faith touched me because I felt healing go out of my body. She said, I did it, Lord. He said, woman, 
Your faith has made you whole. And I want to, I'm going to preach now. If she had listened to the crowd, she would have died in her condition. If some of you listen to some of them, you're going to die in your condition. If some of you listen to your family any longer, you're going to die in your condition. If some of you don't get Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian doctrine out of your mind, you're going to die in your condition. If some of you don't let God pour holy oil into your wine skin, you're going to die in your condition. At some point, you have to say, I'm done with what they think. I'm done with what they say. I'm done with all of that dead religion. I'm going to touch the hem of his garment. His name was Bartimaeus. They called him blind Bartimaeus. How would you like to be known by your handicap or your infirmity? Oh, blind Bartimaeus. He's sitting by the roadside begging. Now, in his blindness, having been there many years, he knows what crowds sound like and what it feels like. But today is different. They're not talking the same stuff. The conversation is different. There is a, an exuberance an excitement and expectation in the crowds as they're going back and forth. And the crowd seems to be growing over there somewhere. And people are running from here to there. And he caught somebody and said, What's going on? What's happening? They said, Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Jesus of Nazareth is just down the street there. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, I've heard of him. He's a healer. He's a miracle worker. I'm a blind man. This may be my only opportunity. The Bible says he had a cloak about him. You see, in those days, handicapped people had to wear different kinds of cloaks. One would signify a leper. Another would sig signify a, a blind man. Others uh, who were crippled had to wear certain colors to be identified. He was covered in his cloak. And when he heard that Jesus was coming by, Watch what he did. Jesus! And immediately, proper people say, shh, shh, don't disturb things. He, they didn't understand he was blind. They were walking around seeing, but he's blind. Jesus! Shh. Now we're telling you, be quiet, don't disturb the master. But every time they said it, he got louder. Why? He knew he had an appointment. There was a time of visitation coming his way. It may never come again. He wasn't going to lose this opportunity. And the closer Jesus got, the louder he cried, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, who is that? That's a blind Bartimaeus. Bring him to me. And the Bible says when they said, the master wishes to see you. He took his cloak and threw it off. Oh, God, have mercy. You know why? He said, I won't be needing this anymore. I'm getting rid of my handicapped parking sign. I'm getting rid of all my weaknesses. I've got an appointment with the healer. What do you want, son? Lord, that I may receive my sight. According to your faith, be it unto you. And his eyes were opened. You better hear me when I preach to you. We're living in a, a very pretentious day in the church. People have a form of godliness, but the power ain't there. You won't find many churches. I'm, I mean in this city right now, having church, having Bible church. They've got a quiet thing going on. They've had some organized music, and it's all pretty for some degree to some degree, and then they'll hear a speech. But how many will come into his gates with thanksgiving? Praise him on the cymbals. Praise him on the high-sounding cymbals. Praise him with stringed instruments. Praise him with drums. Praise him with a loud voice. Praise him with a high-sounding voice. Praise him. Let everything that hath breath Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Yeah. 
And you needn't think that a crowd like that is going to tolerate a loud person who has a need and realizes their appointment is in front of them. No, they will tell you to hush and shut it down. Now understand what I'm about to say. I'm not saying that you can just act anyway when you come to God's house. Because we've got some unstable people here to start with. We've got some overly emotional people, and we've got some people that just want the attention. I understand all that, and I'm watching out for that. But I also know that in this house today are some people who feel that they have no hope unless Jesus touches them today. They have nowhere to go. They've done everything they know to do, but they are here in the presence of God. And when you get in the presence of God, he wants you to call on him. Ten lepers. Jesus is walking down the road and up on the hill are ten leprous men. They see Jesus. Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus looks up at ten men full of leprosy and says, go your way and show yourself to the priest. What he was doing was fulfilling the law, you see. Because the law required that if a man or a woman were to be recognized as cleansed from leprosy, the priest had to make the decision. He had to examine them, and if he found no, no residue of leprosy, he could say, you're clean. They could go back into society. Lord, have mercy on us. Well, then go show yourself to the priest. Here's what the Bible said. And as they went... Okay, let's go. We got leprosy, but he said, go, let's go. And as they went, they looked and said, oh, my God, it's gone. We're clean. But had they never moved from that spot, they would never have been healed. If they had not moved in the way of Christ, obeyed the command of Christ as they went. They didn't get healed before they went. They got healed while they were going. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And all ten of them started jumping up and down. Look, we're clean. We can go back into society. Nine of them said, I'm going to a restaurant. I'm going to get a good meal. I'm going to go back down into town and do some shopping. I'm going to visit friends and relatives. I'm going to have a normal life. I'm clean from leprosy. But one said, oh my God, I must go back and I must fall at his feet and I must worship him. And that's exactly what he did. He knew where his health and healing came from. And he fell at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus, while he was there, said, wait a minute, weren't there 10 who were cleansed? Where are the nine? I only see this one fella. And then as the man was down worshiping at the feet of Jesus, Jesus must have picked him up and said, Son, your faith has made you whole. Do you see what I see? He said to the others, You've been cleansed. But when this fella came back to worship, Jesus said, You're whole. They got a physical healing. You got a spiritual healing. Oh! You got, they got temporary help and health. You've got eternal life. Let me tell you something. When Jesus does it for you, don't run off and say, now I can live like I was living. When Jesus touches you and changes your life, when he performs a miracle in your life, that's not an excuse to go back and do what you've been doing. He touches you and delivers you so you can go fall at his feet and live the rest of your life to his glory. Don't miss your appointment. Every one of you stirred by the Spirit right now is facing 
an appointment with Jesus Christ. Let me tell you again, these things don't come all the time. These moves of the Spirit, these revivals, these times of refreshing don't come all the time. They come when He sends them. I don't feel what I've been feeling now for almost three months all the time. This is a move of the Holy Spirit on me and in me, and I recognize that. I, I cannot pray the way I've been moved to pray in myself. This is a divine thing, a divine appointment. And I am telling you, I am desperate not to miss it. And I've declared, I have declared before the congregation at 8.30 as the pastor of this church, we're not going to miss this appointment with God. See, he's waiting on you to stop and say, here I am, O oh Lord. Why, if you remember the day that Jesus was raised from the dead, there were two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Remember that? And they were walking along talking to each other about what had just happened in Jerusalem and, and the last three days and all of the events, including the crucifixion. And as they're talking, a third man just shows up. They didn't hear him coming. They didn't see him coming. He just shows up. And he says, what you boys talking about? And they said, well, who are you? Are you a stranger in these here parts? Have you not known what's been going on the last three days? How we thought that Jesus of Nazareth was our Messiah, but they killed him and they buried him. And just this morning, some women said they went to his tomb and it was empty. We thought he would be our Messiah. And the scriptures say that's when Jesus started teaching them. The Psalms, the prophets, and Moses that he was their deliverer. It was Jesus that showed up. Uh, he wasn't invited. It was time. It was an appointment. The sweet presence of Jesus just overshadowed them. And before they knew it, they were talking to the Son of God himself, raised from the dead. And here's an interesting part of that scripture. It said, as the sun was going down, they decided to go to their house and Jesus would have gone on but they invited him to come for dinner. Did you hear that? He would have gone on. He would have just kept walking. He didn't say, can I go with you guys please? I'm hungry. I got something to tell you. He just would have gone on. But they said, wait now, oh, it's late. Why don't you come and abide with us? And Jesus did. And the Bible says when they sat down to eat, Jesus grabbed a piece of bread and broke it. I'm about to hold myself down now. Jesus broke it. And then it says when he broke the bread, their eyes were opened and they saw him in the breaking of the bread. And they said, oh, we saw him do that just a few hours ago. This is Jesus. And he disappeared. And they went everywhere preaching and telling Jesus. But you see, if they had been too caught up in themselves, if they had been inhospitable people, if they had missed their appointment, they would have let Jesus just walk on by and they would have missed the breaking of the bread. They would have missed the revelation of the risen Savior just because they weren't thinking. So I come to my congregation and I'm asking you, please understand that this stirring in the leaves of your heart, this, this breath, this slight gentle agitation down in your soul is Jesus. This is your appointment. This is the time of your visitation. Do not miss this. That's why I opened up saying to the parents, you know, if Jesus tarries, God may not move on this church like this in another three or four years. And by that time, your teenagers will be in college. And by that time, your toddlers will already be in 
junior high and something will have taken place in their heads. That's why I as a pastor am telling you once again, parents, there is something more important than straight A's and finding the best sport for your child and making every school appointment and that better thing is that somehow they get exposed to a wave of Holy Ghost power, a prayer movement in a congregation where people, I say it again, are stretched out before God, crying out for God, longing for God, and realize that Jesus is coming soon. Folks, you're making too many big plans. Oh, I didn't do this at 8.30, but I got to do it right now. Some of you have made way longer term plans than you need to be making. You've projected things way out there too far. You've forgotten that Jesus could come any moment. I tell you, he's standing on the brink of coming back to this earth. God's got a church ready. God's got a remnant that wants Jesus more than they want breath itself. God's got angels already assembling around Jesus that are going to follow him back to this earth. I tell you, you may not have a decade. You may not have two more years. The coming of the Lord is upon us. Does anybody else believe this? Stand with me, please. I I think I've said everything you wanted me to say, Lord. Now it's up to you, sweet Holy Spirit. Stir us. Take us to the place that we truly, we say it with our mouths, but we don't live it with our lives. Take us to the place where money does not matter. Real estate, houses, clothes, popularity, glory, praise of men does not matter. We have never been made happy by a thing. All of our joy has come from Him. Oh God. I vow before you this day in front of this church as much as is within me, I will not let us miss the time of our visitation from heaven. Lord, I vow before you and in front of them if I don't eat again for a week, if I don't get off my face for three days, if that's what it takes, I will not let this church miss the time of our visitation. You see, brothers and sisters, all through Scripture, before God visited somebody, He raised up a man to tell them God was going to visit. Paul implored every church. He said, strive with me in prayer. That didn't mean go say a quick little prayer and feel better. He said, strive, labor with me in prayer that the saints may know the fullness of God. I'm going to tell you right now, brothers and sisters, I came into Charlotte with darker hair 44 years ago. I was spitting and screaming and spewing and quoting scripture and laying hands on the sick. And that's how I'm going to leave this old world. I'm going to preach till fire comes out of my nostrils. I'm going to preach till the dead are raised. I'm going to preach until these old religious structures are torn to the ground and all that's left is a heart that cries out for more of Jesus Christ. So if you're ashamed of that kind of stuff, you're in the wrong place because this preacher is going to preach like his coattail is on fire because my heart is burning up and fire is shut up in my bones. Who wants this appointment with God? Who wants this appointment with God? Come down here and join me around this altar if you would, please. I don't care how packed it is. I don't care if you get on the stairs or in the aisles. I don't care about any of that. 
I just want you to understand that we're about to be visited by God Almighty. The Bible says in the last days, signs and wonders would be a part of the church. These signs shall follow them that believe. They'll lay hands on the sick. The sick shall recover. They'll speak with new tongues. If they take up a serpent that's deadly, it won't harm them. If they drink anything that's poison, it won't kill them. And we will preach the gospel everywhere we go. Say it again. I want this appointment. You don't even know what it is, but will you agree with me? Rob and I agree that the remnant throughout Charlotte, North Carolina that's hungry and thirsty for righteousness and don't know where to go, their hearts are crying out for a move of the Holy Spirit. They want to be baptized with fire. They want to hear the gospel. They want to be where the Spirit of God is moving. I pray that you will direct them in this direction, O God. 43 years ago, you sent me to this city and told me that you were going to build a great Pentecostal worship center. I believe the time of that visitation is upon us, Almighty God. So I pray that you will quicken them and awaken them. Just as you sent people in this congregation, they didn't know where they were coming. They didn't know about this church. They just showed up. God! Send them so that they can be joined with us in this almighty revival of prayer as we anticipate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You agree with me, brother, on that? Anybody agree with me on that? God's sweet sheep don't deserve to be sitting in mortuaries listening to undertakers read Shakespeare to the cemetery. God's got a remnant out there and they're crying out. They don't even know what they're crying out. Oh God. And let me say this before you sing again. The Lord taught me this this week. Many of my prayers have been hindered. When I would pray for sick people, my prayers have been hindered with this. Maybe it's not the Lord's will. I don't want to impose my will on the Lord. And the Lord said to me, this week, stop it. Stop it. And then he gave me David. David said, the Lord is a sun and shield. He will give grace and glory. Listen, no good thing will he withhold 
to those who walk uprightly. That's what he said. Then he took me to 2 Corinthians where Paul said, all the promises of God are yes and amen. Yes, he did. Then he took me to 2 Peter and it said, whereby we are given to us great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. God wants to heal. God wants to deliver. God wants you to have his promises. Don't delay it by saying if it's your will. It is his will for his people to be blessed, filled. Hallelujah. All the earth. here now that body you're in is not your body Amen. Jesus bought that body Amen. you don't have a right to use it for anything but his glory Amen. listen to me that breath in your lungs is keeping you alive right now that's not your breath he put that breath in there you don't have a right to hold it back to restrain it because you're uncomfortable he put breath in you for it to rise to the glory of him who sits on the throne. I want you, every one of you, to lift your hands. And I want you to bless the name of God with that breath he gave you. God's been good to you.
When I was little, the old timers used to preach till they were sopping, soaking wet. And they'd say something like this. This thing was born in a fire. It can't live in an icebox. <laughs> and that's the truth. Let's take a break. Come back tomorrow night with prepared hearts to pray not only for that remnant, but to pray that God will move in those churches and move upon pastors to be saved, if not, but filled with the Spirit so that this whole city will see the effects of prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength, my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Blessings on you. Death could not hold